So people who do business transformation, right? We spend a lot of time thinking. Um, mm -hmm. We're looking at things. We're diving in. Um, I have a former boss who we we would talk about how we value always arriving at a meeting with a stance. And so meaning like you already know what you feel, right, is yep. the right process, the right solution. And a lot of people who do our type of work, right, that's our job. Um, mm -hmm. We approached it that way. And so I like to remind people to say, if you know the most, say the least. Hello, my name is Heath Gascoigne and I am the host of the Business Transformation Podcast. And this is the show for business transformators who are part business strategists, part business designers, part collaborators, and part negotiators. Business transformators have moved past just business design and includes oversight of implementation of those business designs and business transformations and includes stakeholder management, coordination, and negotiation. If you work in strategy development and implementation and ensure that the strategy is aligned to the business design and technology, then you're probably a business transformator. This is the show where we speak to industry experts and professionals to share their stories, strategies, and insights to help you start, turn around, and grow your business transformation. Welcome to the Business Transformation Podcast, and in this episode, we are talking to one of those industry experts. We are speaking to Lauren. Now, Lauren, you're going to have to forgive me on my Italian pronunciation. Guerreri. Uh, Guerreri. Lauren Guerreri who is a director of business transformation for Guidewell, uh, has been managing consulting and, and change management for over a decade, a decade, and has consulted in every continent and set except Antarctica. So a little plug there. If you are any potential clients as a result of this uh, episode or a result of uh, Lauren's background, um, want to and have some business in uh, Antarctica, um, Lauren, I'm sure we'll like to round out that box and put a tick in the box that she's now com um, consulted in every single um, continent on the world, on the earth. Yes, sir. Okay, and yes, and as, as part of those consultations, uh, has consulted for Fortune 500 and companies and currently resides in Florida. And put that in context, I am currently in the UK, not in uh, uh, London as I usually am. I'm up, up here for a, a large, uh, leading a large transformation. So just to put a context for our listeners that we're talking about two different continents um, from different parts of the world. So what will Lauren and, and I will discuss and talk about uh, so keep in mind that this may not as often gets accused as that, oh, that's only happens in the US. What you may find is it is across the world, across continents. Um, it's not unique to the States or not unique to the UK or the US, uh, the um, United Kingdom. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. So Lauren, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. So excited to be here. Okay, great. Now we uh, so because you have uh, a, a vast over a decade experience in consulting and change management, um, we all keep it uh, an agenda so that we stay on topic. Because you know, I, one, I love this and I love this topic, um, and I could talk about it for hours, and we really don't have hours. <laughs> uh, we we got to um, you know, we keep it within within an hour if we can. Um, okay, for the for the purpose of our um, audience, we'll keep it to three points. Uh, first one being the what is the, uh, the the profile of a business transformator? What is the ideal type of person that would make a good transformator? Um, number two being um, empathy. Empathy is a tool set, as a uh, as a tool or technique. Um, how do you use it? Is it necessary in transformation? And thirdly, the industry. What is the industry doing well, and what is it not doing well? Where can we improve? Okay. Yeah, that so, topic alone, right, Heath, could take several, several podcasts, that last one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, not wanting to throw stones or, you know, because like we live in glass houses, right? So, you know, it's like we're all guilty right. of it. Yeah, yeah. So as observers and also practitioners in, in this industry, um, what are we seeing? It's, uh, I can see a perfect example coming to this program I've just joined. It's like, oh, okay, so I can see your thinking. I see why you're doing that, but is that the right thing to do? Yeah. Hmm. It's our job, oh. right? while we're here <laughs> yep exactly so okay so first up profile what's the ideal profile of a business transformator practitioner and why is it why is it important yeah so i think um let me make two disclaimers and then let mm. me say something um yep. that most people who hire for this position um, hire these types of roles are going to find i found that they find a little bit crazy 
um, and I'm going to explain it. So the first is I'm not a PhD. I do have master's coursework in organizational design and, and that type of people dynamics. Um, but um, I oftentimes when I make statements like this, you know, the people in the scientific community, they do this for a living. They want to talk about all this different stuff. I'm not qualified to talk about that. Just here giving you my experience. Right. Yep. Uh -huh. um, and then the second is um, when I talk about um, business transformators, I get really excited. I like to talk about the way they think and how it's kind of fundamentally different than others. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes people interpret that if they, you know, maybe don't fit that mold, as I am saying, they can't be good at business transformation mm -hmm. or um, yep. they're less intelligent. I'm not saying that either. I'm just uh -huh. giving you a profile of people I've seen do this very successfully okay. and why I think that is. Great. So the thing I'm going to say that's a little wild um, is I think transformators are born that way. Um, uh, I think it's an innate skill. I think you come out of the womb um, with a way of thinking that is just different um, than everyone around you. Um, and my evidence for that, right, is we've all heard those kids on the playground or in the schoolyard, um, and you hear them say things like, they get upset, right? And you say, why are you upset? And they'll say, because they're not playing house right. Yep. Um, or I'm going to take my ball and go because they're yep. not doing what I say, right? Yep. They're in the classrooms and they're, they're challenging the teacher. Uh -huh. um, yep. And why are they doing that things? Well, some set of those kids are just difficult and don't have people skills, right? But mm -hmm. yep. another subset of those kids, I would argue, are born with this thought process, this business transformation mindset, where they're looking at the whole picture, start to end, the big picture as a process, and they're breaking it down into components. And they're starting to see places where things could be better, whatever their definition of better is as a child, right? Yeah, but yeah. it's not always the most efficient, but they're challenging because they have this innate need to simplify a system, to simplify chaos. Uh -huh. And to me, yep. the fact that we see that in young children means that people are born with that mindset. Now, I've talked to people about this before, and I also um, fall into a trap sometimes. So I'm going to make one more disclaimer. Yep. Because um, people will sometimes come at me <laughs> when I yep. say that and say, well, we see more people in engineering fields and STEM careers that are male versus female. Um, so yep. are you saying more males are born with that ability to see the big picture and work through process than females? And to be really clear, we're not going to get into gender normatives today, but yeah. um, no, I'm not saying that. I think what I am saying is that um, people who are born male, female, in between that dichotomy or outside, um, all have the capability of being born with that analytical mindset. Mm -hmm. And how that is kind of rewarded um, and nurtured in someone is what leads someone, in my opinion, into STEM careers, right? So um, that's wild to a lot of people who hire because... Um, I'll, I'll get a lot of pushback saying we got to hire with certain certifications. We got to hire out of certain experience. Yep. I want, I want engineers, right. To be my architects. And I think that it's likely those people have the right analytical mindset, but I don't think those certifications, those education, that career is what gives them that. I think it hones and, and sharpens it, but I think you're born, you're born um, with that type of mindset personally. Okay. That's like the, um, the, the challenge about a lead is born or mate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And, and you're saying that they are a fun, at most part, fundamentally born that way. That's good. That's, yep. Yep. And Is I hire it? that way too. Yep. I know in an interview, right. Um, I'm not necessarily going to disqualify someone because their experience, um, I'm going to look and I, you know, when you talk to somebody, if they can do, I call it seeing through the matrix. If they yep. see the ones and zeros or they don't, um, you can pick that up pretty quickly in talking to someone. That's a good one. Seeing through the matrix. So I've got a couple of quotes there already. You've said that I think are great. So you be, be uh, look out for those that I'll be quoting you on. Yeah. So when you, when you say STEM careers, STEM careers in the traditional sense, engineering or some sort of idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Architecture. Yep. Um, and I think to what you see in people, um, either children, right. Or adults as that gets honed is this really specific thought pattern that I think makes a really good business transformator. And it's not, it's that they can see the system, right? They can yep. identify the components, but a system in chaos or a system unsimplified to them is almost like this visceral injustice. It's more than I just need to accomplish the goal. They need the system to be simplified, to feel satisfied. It's, and you'll hear that in the passion and the way they talk about things. They don't want to, they don't want to do it the right way. They want to accomplish the objectives, but this is the right way, right? Like you hear them say yeah, these kinds of yeah, things. Yeah. 
And again, um, I think really that just goes back to um, that kind of mindset. I like how you, um, there's a lot of more, and especially when you talk about the STEM and that, say the more, um, the hard um, like engineering um, technical um, skills or, or roles, professionals, professions, that when you're coming to transformation um, and moving, not just say an organization from current state to future state or you know, transforming to something else, um, there is people process or people process technology and data that are getting impacted and changed. It's not just the hard, like, let's say, building or process, but the people element. And how do you change people? I, I've always thought of, you know, people are naturally change adverse. And so, but yeah. that's a, as an individual, when you get a group of people together and try to change a group of people, then it's like, well, to the uninitiated, you think, good luck with that. Because you've got one person was hard to change, let alone a group of people. And when you get in an organization context where it is almost, uh, you know, these standards and norms and SOPs and so everyone's working a certain ways of working. And now you're going to change that. Yeah. It's like, well, how do you do that? Now, so when we, you're talking now of um, really the, a lot on the mindset, the mindset yep. of the person changing the others. And so, yeah, so that, that I, I just hope the, the audience there picked that up that um, it, there's, and you even said it about looking for when you hire um, a particular mindset as opposed to the qualification. You said you didn't qualif disqualify anyone because of their qualification or experience, but it's the mindset that you're looking for. That's exactly right. And um, I think one of the other things that's unique to someone who has this mindset is actually um, kind of what leads us into empathy. It, 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 at least in my experience, they tend to prioritize production over people. And when I say that, um, I don't mean they don't care about people, like yep, they're yep. not naturally compassionate. They have this fundamental belief that the value of production serves the people, right? Uh -huh, so the people yep. have this objective getting all the pieces to line up however that has to happen, right? These are risk innovators. However that has to happen um, is going to serve the people. Mm -hmm. So they are people servers. They just don't serve the needs of the people. They serve what they think the people need. And so it's this mindset of them prioritizing the production over people that I think sometimes gets us in trouble. And I actually have some really funny anecdotes, I think. Actually, they may be um, scary, maybe for some <laughs> yeah. folks. They're funny to me now. Okay. Um, they were very frightening at that yeah. point yeah. of my career. But um, that actually led me to, to kind of learn that the hard way that I'm hoping I can maybe save some of your early listeners from having to experience. Okay. I think they're ready. <laughs> well, you know, I want some, some antidotes. I, I think, yeah, that is a very close, um, you can be, from, from a practitioner's point of view, if you're seen to, um, most probably not disacknowledge, but un, and not acknowledge to the degree they probably would think. Um, it's like technology coming in. So we're going to change the technology. And then people go, well, what about us? You know, yeah, you, is this a, technology lead program or is this a business lead program so yeah so i could see where um you could get in trouble um if the maybe it's in the messaging that if you get the messaging right the delivery won't be so bad that's exactly right um and that that's what i had to learn the hard way um so i think i'm a perfectly nice person like i volunteer um i meet people they tend to like me it's fine yep. um but i had a lot of experiences earlier in my career where things like this would happen. Um, so one particularly insane call, um, I had, it was an after hours call, the client called me, we're on the phone, um, she's walking me through kind of some product gaps she's seeing, she, she's got some problems um, that she wants technology built for, um, and I'm walking her through it, and this is a long call, like we're having like an hour long yeah. conversation. Um, and I'm walking her through kind of what I think next steps are and how, how to get there. Yep. And then she hits me with it. What is was just mind blowing. She says to me, you're the reason that my children don't feel they have a mother. Oh, and and he, uh, I just went, <laughs> yeah. what, yeah. what? Um, yeah, right. Yeah, I think we're yeah. having this perfectly nice business yeah. conversation. Like she called me after hours. It's not like I kept her there. Um, yeah. And I just did not know what to make of that. Uh -huh. We're going to put that on the table for a minute. Yeah. Then <laughs> I have another client, right? Um, they call me. They're having some um, problems in their operations. They're telling me about the problems they're seeing. 
they're asking me about how other people in the industry are solving this. Um, it's kind of just one of those off the cuff, it's not like an engagement, like we're not doing a consulting engagement. They just wanted some feedback, um, some consultation, right? Um, and I walked them through like what I see people do and what I'd recommend that they do and how I'd recommend they'd approach that. Um, and I go home and I think that's a perfectly nice and fine conversation, right? Yep. I come back the next day. My boss calls me into his office and he's like, hey, did you talk to this client yesterday? I said, sure did. And they're like, oh, okay, great. Um, did you tell him this? I said, I sure did. Um, I still see no problem, right? And she goes, well, he's freaking out. Um, he, it was too much for him to handle. He may not want to be a client anymore. Like this is a big deal. And again, yeah. I'm shocked, right? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fast forward, um, uh -huh. my company goes through a merger and acquisition. Um, and I am training our whole department before that. Um, there became this leadership position. Um, there's a big integration, right? When we've all, hopefully, if you've not been through a merger and acquisition, there's a whole lot of um, integration that happens. You've yeah. got a free line technology yeah. people, right? Um, and so um, there was a leadership position that came up. I'm like, oh, okay, great. I'm going to apply for that. I train our whole department. I have a great track record of success. Like I know our technology in and out, right? Um, I go through my interviews. They're all brilliant, right? I get in, I get called in for the decision. I think I'm getting great news. Um, I sit down and they're like, hey, we recognize you have an exceptional track record. You've never lost a client. Like qual quality assurance is through the roof. You train everybody. Your plan is brilliant. Um, we're going to use it, but we're not going to give you the position. And again, <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's the wildest thing I feel like I've ever heard. <laughs> well, and, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and But we need you to walk the person that we are going to hire through your plan and whatever. I'm a team player, so I did yeah, yeah. it. Um, but um, the reasoning was they said, hey, in a merger and acquisition, right, people are worried about redundancy. They're worried about layoffs. Um, and we need somebody who has this emotional management skill set oh. that we're not sure that you have. Um, and we're worried that without that, people are going to get so panicked, they will leave. Um, and this was uh -huh. the wake up call. Uh -huh. uh, yep. I was like, something is not right, right? I'm producing value. I think I'm doing a great job. I'm not being unprofessional or, or in my opinion, rude to anyone, but something's not quite right about what I'm doing. Yep. Um, and so I actually took a mentor. I'm going to give a quick shout out to Craig Co. Um, and we did what we deemed um, how to be nice lessons. Again, I'm a super nice person. It was just a, a joking thing we called this. Um, but he actually kind of imparted with me um, some tips and tricks to um, start to value empathy um, mm -hmm. yep. and, and learn how to do this type of emotional management. Um, and what I learned is that um, right when you're making decisions, they're driven by data and facts, right? That's yep. when we're doing yeah. process Evidence. consulting, yep. that's what we're doing. Yep. Um, I learned to consider people's emotions facts about people. Um, people are moving in that process and their emotions are data we can't ignore. Um, and so that's kind of where I started to coin emotions are facts about people. Emotions um, are facts about people. That's correct. They okay. are data points about people. Um, they cannot be ignored. Just like you couldn't ignore data about anything else, you can't yeah. ignore emotions. Uh -huh. um, Good. And I remember, um, and so I'm just going to give um, this disclaimer to your audience. Don't turn me off because if some of you are like me, I remember him telling me um, not all the things I'm about to share with you guys, but some of them. Yep. And my face um, is very expressive. And I remember him saying, I know you think this is dumb. I understand you don't value this, but you like science, right? Do it. Let's do a scientific experiment. Do it. Let's see what happens. See the result. Yep. Um, Yep. And um, honestly, it made such a fundamental change um, in my ability to get things done faster in the um, it lessened conflict. Um, I got to decisions easier. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this is when I started to say, OK, you know what? Empathy and emotional management is a skill set. Um, it's a tool belt. And just like learning anything else, this is something that's not just warm and fuzzy. Um, it has a lot of value. Okay, you know, very good. You know, I, I, I'm a big, big fan of that. You know, I've been on a, a few projects there where I even the last client, they'd already thought they'd have a, a vision. It, it wasn't. Um, it was an objective. I said, no, no, what you need is a vision, what actually the business will look like in five years' time. 
there's method to that, strategies, objectives, and measures, so you can measure our progress towards it. But the people who put this together have to be from the business because they're looking for the the why, w, the what's in it for me, the WIIFM, yeah. the radio station they can all tune into. Well, they're all, everyone by default tunes it. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 we got this. I said, you watch this. I said, have you done this kind of program before? And they said, well, not to this scale. And I said, how'd you go in the last one? Well, not too good. I said, now you're going to do a bigger program doing it the same way that you did it before is going to get what? A different result. I got news for you. It's going to get the same result, but this time the impact's going to be worse because you're doing something you've never done before. And then I said, so how do you propose? And I told them, I said, the reason why we're going to get the business in here to help put that together, this vision is going to be the voice to represent their views on this, on this vision. So it answers that WIF here. And they go, but why is that important? I said, because when people start seeing it, it's not in for me, they'll tune out and they'll just cross their arms and say, I'll just wait for you guys to finish what you're doing. And then I'm going to go back to how it was before. And this is what will happen. And they said, well, that's what happened yeah. last time. Is it? Yeah. Or so worse this- yet, they'll tank it on purpose, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I've oh, seen yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Tank on purpose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the, um, what it's like putting the, uh, the proverbial stick and fork in the spokes. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. doesn't work. And then the subtext is because I won't do it. <laughs> right. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah. The uh, hidden. <laughs> Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's that was your awakening um, to uh, to uh, emotion as a empathy as a as a um, a, t- uh, a tool set as a um, a toolbox a a, um, a skill set that you need to uh, one if you don't have it naturally because you're not a natural born um, transmitter develop it but be conscious of it. Yeah. So I think, um, again, right, going back to people are naturally born, sometimes prioritizing production over people. Yeah. Um, This developing an empathy tool set, which does not, honestly, in my opinion, come very naturally to people with Mm. an analytical mindset, right? It's it's somewhat counter opposed um, to that. And so um, developing this is what I see take people from being like good or great, maybe even what they do to being exceptional. Um, and so one thing is people confuse this a lot. Compassion and empathy are not the same thing. Um, compassion uh-huh. means that you're feeling their feelings. You care deeply, right? You're, yep. you're crying, you're bleeding for them. Like you feel it in the same visceral way they do. Empathy, and I wore my empathy shirt today. Um, mm-hmm. Empathy yeah. <laughs> is the ability to step into someone else's shoes um, in an effort to understand their feelings and their perceptions. And this is the most important part, in an effort to drive behavior. It is a skill, it is a tool. Um, you're not just doing that so you can say, oh, I you know, feel bad for them. You're doing it to say, what, what is the root cause or what is the symptom of this behavior I'm seeing that I want to change? And so that's kind of the difference between compassion and empathy. Um, okay, so compassion is that you can understand the feelings that someone is going through. Empathy is the ability to step into someone else's shoes to understand what they're feeling in order to, for a purpose, to drive a particular behavior. That's correct. And if you're not naturally empathetic and you're not naturally compassionate, I'm going to give you some tips. Uh Um, And I'm also going to let you know, you can fake it until you make it. Okay, Um, very good. It's helpful. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Um, So a lot of these are going to be around communication. Um, Some of them are going to be around um, some activities I'd recommend. So we'll do do the first set around communication. Yep. Um, One. Fluff your emails. Um, That's a term I like to use. Um, Fluff your emails. Fluff them. That's right. Okay. Um, People who are not analytical minded and not everyone you talk to will be, um, don't interpret things the same way. If someone sent me an email, it might be something that said, hey, this task is due by five. Are we on track? Right? That's a perfectly acceptable email to me. Yeah. Um, To some people, that's harsh and it's aggressive. Um, and so, and especially if they're not on track. Yeah. So how that email might look fluffed is, um, good morning, happy Saturday. Um, just a friendly reminder, um, that, that, um, this task is due by 5 PM. Um, do you feel you need any support to get that completed or are you on track? Happy to yep. help however I can. Right. Yep. 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 And so I take a general template there. There's always a nice greeting. Um, there's always something we're celebrating. All reminders are friendly and we're always willing to help. We always end it with that. We're willing to help because here's the thing. If we need that task from someone and they don't know how to do it or aren't equipped to do it or aren't on track and we don't tell them we're willing to help, 
they may just ignore us if they need help, right? They may just yeah. not do it. Yep. So, okay. So, one, greeting, a reminder, and the offer to help. Yep. Okay. Very good. Um, the second is to always put um, business after people when you start a meeting. Um, so, this is actually kind of a cultural thing. So, I'm from um, Northern Eastern America. And in Southern Eastern America, um, there's a lot of culture differences. So Northern Eastern Americans, um, like Pennsylvania, they're fast talkers. We're aggressive fast talkers. Um, are you, are South, you consider yourself a fast talker? <laughs> yeah. Do you not consider me a fast talker? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there you are a fast talker. You are very fast. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Sorry okay, about so, that. I can yeah, try that, to slow down. <laughs> no, no, it's great. I'll, you know. Like if you to uh, New Zealanders and Australian, or more so New Zealanders compared to, uh, let's say the English. Um, uh, no disrespect to my English colleagues, you know they uh, uh, Kiwis can talk can talk fast. Okay, so when you say North Eastern, so this is uh, this is where you are right now. Uh, no, no, um, no. This no, that's, is that's where I grew up. So like uh, okay. like New York, Pittsburgh. Pennsylvania, yep. like those types of states were aggressive fast talkers. Um, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, these types of states and the southern eastern southern, part of yep. the United States, um, they tend to be slower, more polite talkers. Um, okay. And again, that's not saying like people from the north are mean, people from the south are nice. It's just a cultural way they communicate, the cadence that they communicate with one another, the way they okay. pause, yep. what they talk about even. Um, and so what I have found is um, if you put business after people in the start of a meeting, um, that yep. kind of resonates with everyone culturally uh -huh. and it makes work seem small. And so what does that look like? Um, you might bring up the weather. I don't because oftentimes yep. I have people I'm talking to who are in um, an example, Minnesota um, with someone I was talking to one time and I said, Oh man, it's, it's cold today. Um, and they said, Oh yeah, it's cold here too. What temperature is it there? And yeah. I think I said something like 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I think that's close to zero Celsius. Um, or something like that. Um, but yeah, they yeah. said it's negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit here. So Whoa. I, Whoa. I tend to, I tend to stay away from weather. Um, cause yeah. I don't want people, you know, to feel bad about my sunny weather here in Florida. Yeah. Um, but what that looks like is maybe talking about, you know, what you're planning to do later in the day, um, asking yeah. people about their lives, um, make the work smaller. Um, when you do that, That's you it. humanize it. Um, it makes what you're about to say seem less impactful because you're reminding people there's a life right outside mm -hmm. of what we're talking about mm -hmm. um, and making the work smaller, putting the business after the people um, is a good step to both humanize yourself, um, humanize the conversation and make anything you're about to deliver seem less intense. Okay. Very good. Now I, I had a, um, a former program director um, come and present to a new program that I was on. And um, one of the on his first introduction to a room of about three hundred people, he started talking about his daughter and the pram, and and it's like I was going, this is a very interesting approach here, and then it had a lead into what we were talking, but uh, he did spend some time talking about it, and it's like very personable, and it's like, yep. and then it was like, and everyone it just just brought down the, um, I don't know the, the formalities in the room of oh, this yep. is going to be one of these executive presentations that we just got to keep our upper our nose up and chin up and, and and say what we need to say but it was like oh yeah no he's one of us and everyone yeah. relaxed and and then everyone got along and then you know that, that normally forming storming thing and group dynamics and everyone got along great and it was like okay very nice i like it and that's yeah so that would have been the business after people yep okay nice one humanize it good yep um, so people who do business transformation, right? We spend a lot of time thinking, um, mm -hmm. we're looking at things, we're diving in. Um, I have a former boss who we, we would talk about how we value always arriving at a meeting with a stance. Um, and so meaning like you already know what you feel, right? Is yep. the right process, the right solution. And a lot of people who do our type of work, right? That's our job. Um, mm -hmm. we approached it that way. And so I like to remind, um, people to say, if you know the most, say the least. Uh -huh. um, because you, you have to know the most, say the least. That's right. Um, and that seems counterintuitive, right? But you want to give people time and the opportunity whose full time job this is not to mm. catch up to where you are. Yeah. Um, because you can't pull people along. They've got to get in the car themselves. 
Yeah. Um, can't drag them behind. Can't lead horse to water. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then um, some other things that you might want to do in meetings is um, I like to ask questions rather than providing responses. So let's say that somebody brings something up. Um, and we're doing, you know, we're brainstorming, right? Um, and we're, we're whiteboarding it out, putting things in parking lots, right? Um, and someone says, um, I, we want to do it this way, right? Or this is the way we should do it. Yep. And you know, right? Because you've arrived at that meeting with a stance and you've reviewed yep. all the facts that you know that is not what we're doing. Um, you still write that on the board, right? Because that's part of it. Um, but what you don't say is, hey, I don't think we should do that mm. because of X, Y, Z. Yeah. You ask a question. You say, hey, how do you think we would handle the transition of this to this? Let's play that out. Um, and usually when you play that out, and it takes several more minutes, right, um, yeah. than just saying no, um, people get there themselves. And so I oftentimes you know, advise people, hey, don't respond, inquire. Um, ask more questions, they'll get there themselves. People are logical, um, even though they sometimes behave what seems illogically. Um, and everyone, assume everyone has good intent, assume everyone yes. wants yep. what's best. Yep. Okay. You know, I, um, so, like that. so ask questions as opposed to provide solutions. Um, yep. Yeah, that's as, yeah, like that is that you got to yeah, ask the questions. Like I, on the, on the last client, I said to them, um, they had a lot of consultants come in and they're very keen to adopt whatever the consultant said. And I'd say, well, I've got a lean coach. We've got a lean coach. We've brought in this coach and we've brought in that coach and the six sigma this. And, and I was going, okay, that's, that's good. Then that's nice. Okay. So but now tell me, how are you going to use that? And they'll show me a massive presentation and I go, okay, guys, you know, well, if we step back for a second, you do know what we're looking at here, right? This this presentation that you are basically basing everything on is two parts. There's a commercial element to it, and then there's a marketing element to it. Now, what you guys are doing now, if you're taking it as gospel, is that this is the Bible, and we're going to follow it to the letter. But I, I'm going to be honest with you. This wasn't designed for you to pick up and do what you're doing. This was designed for, for the consultants to get more work. And so in order to do that, they must have created something that's huge, and it's going to last for, out for for days and months and years. And if you didn't like it, you probably could scale it down to even just a year, but still is massive. So yeah. uh, so I recommend from from this point on, we're going to adopt the new ways of working. And then we're going to call it the modus operandi, operandi of the, our mode of operation, our standard method of operating, which is question the question. The first thing we're going to do is question the question. And that includes even questioning me. So I'm not beyond reproach or beyond re question. Now you question me because what you've just decided that you've got a lean coach and you're going to, so what, you've, what you're doing for your lean coach, you're optimizing all the absolute possibility of every single process, but you haven't asked why. So what you're going to, you've actually done, if I look at your processes, you've, you've telling me that we can't touch certain processes which are in scope because you've already optimized them. But what you've actually done is just picked a handful that on paper, virtually, not physically, yeah. that you have optimized in terms of a process but what you've killed is the customer experience so you have optimized to the nth degree that you possibly could at a, at a cost of the customer experience and you in another hand you said we our customer experience is a priority so um you, no one's questioning the, the why you're doing things something so you know on, so those same thing is is ask the questions as opposed to provide the solutions that's right everything comes with a cost too right so oh, you got to figure course. out what people value Everything um, comes at a cost. Yeah. Everything, right? <laughs> everything comes at a cost. That's great. This, I don't have any good quotes we've got now. Uh, <laughs> there's a few there. Okay. Everything comes at a cost. That's right. Um, okay. Another thing in speaking, um, especially if there's cultural differences, is calm, measured pauses. Um, because I'm a fast talker, um, I oftentimes I had to get really comfortable in silence. And yep. so, um, I oftentimes will be quiet probably 10 more seconds longer, um, depending on who I'm talking to, um, than I normally would so that I give people room to interject. Um, and so that's okay. another thing to keep in mind, especially again, if you've thought through all of this, if you're excited about it, if you have passion, um, remember to give people space to talk, calm measured pauses after everything you say. Calm measured pauses. Yep. Yep. Okay. After everything, 10 seconds or longer. 
Are you calling this the uncomfortable pauses? Because sometimes uh, they I'm are. being uncomfortable in silence, yeah. Yeah. Uncomfortable silence, that's right. Especially yes. if you're a consultant, right? You're paid to talk, mm. essentially. Right? Yeah. You're paid to talk and think. So when you're quiet, people sometimes think they have to fill up all the noise um, and you don't. So, yeah. um, And then um, two more in communication. So delayed no. Um, delayed no was by far the one that I was most skeptical of. And I thought was going to be just the dumbest. Mm -hmm. um, but it is actually really powerful. So what that means um, is no. if you delayed no. Um, if you and this is this is straight from Craig Co. So I really got to give him some credit for that. Um, but what it is is essentially um, if you're gonna say no to something, if you know something is not the right solution, even if it's not in brainstorming, let's pretend you got an email. Wait on it. Wait on the no. Um, don't not respond because that's terrible. Um, respond and tell people you're thinking about it, even if you're not. Even if you're already done thinking about it. Um, uh -huh, because. Okay. What this does is it helps people feel validated um, in their ideas. You're partnering with them, right? Even if it only took you 10 seconds to think through, you did think through it. Just tell them, hey, yeah. that is an interesting idea. Let me think about that. Let me go talk to some other people. Let me work through what that might look like. And you might go back and ask more questions, right? Questions versus response. Um, but you're going to want to delay that no. And that doesn't mean days or weeks, right? You don't want to do it at expense of the project. Um, but as long as that decision equal to its like priority and urgency, some things will have to be delayed no in a few hours. Some things can afford to be delayed no a few days. Some things can be a week or more. Um, it kind of just depends on your timelines, what the urgency of that decision is. Mm -hmm. But delayed so no helps yep. build partnership. Okay. So the objective there is the first, they feel validated. And then second, it helps them build the partnership, helps build the partnership between the stakeholders, the business and, and the project transformation. Yep. And I remember my pushback to this was that's just going to slow everything down. Mm. We mm -hmm. all make better decisions, right? When we've moved all nonsense off the table, right? Let's put all the facts on the table. The fact is that's not going to work. So getting to a no <laughs> faster moves us yeah. forward faster towards yeah. what does work. Right. So that's where my mindset was. And this was one of the most powerful things that I think I ever implemented. Um, I saw drastic changes um, in the way people respond. Okay. So, all right. Yeah. I'm on that same mind too. Well, with the, the previous client, they were in such a hurry. They had these arbitrary dates that they'd put in the calendar and I say, okay, so why we seem to, they'd already gone out an RFP in the first, the first event they'd ever done on the project, no discovery, the straight out the RFP to go out for, for suppliers and go, okay, so you've brought the business architect in to architect the future operating model, the target operating model. But the first thing you've decided to do is go out to RFP for your solution without understanding first the problem. They said, oh, no, no, we've done that. I said, I said, what did you do exactly? Oh, we sent a spreadsheet out to the business, uh, 1,500 staff, to ask them to give, give us their problems. I said, wait, I said, how much are you spending on this uh, on the software a year? And they said, oh, it's going to be uh, around about 30 million over five years. Oh, so about 6 million a year. Okay, I'm going to let you in a little secret. Sending an email out to your staff and asking them to fill out a spreadsheet about what the pain points are, the existing system is not how you do requirements for a 30 million pound yeah. system. And as they, I said, so why are you in such a hurry to, to go for RFP right now before you've understood the problem? Oh, because we've got these dates. I said, who start, who's implemented these dates? Where's these dates come? Oh, the guys upstairs. And I said, oh, but what's the driver? Why are you, why are you going for, for, out, out to the, these dates that you've set is arbitrary. I said, how about we do this? There's a process to this. And where you are right now, you're like in, you know, in my process, it's step five design. And then there's yeah. a few steps before that. Step one is focus. Let's get everyone on the same page. The vision, what's in it for me? Control, governance, framework, design principles, current state, benefits model, and then design. So you guys are in design already without doing any of that. I said, well, it's going to take too long. I said, I tell you what's going to happen here. You're going to build a system based off the the pain points that your business have given them and what's going to happen when they deliver this technology is going to say the, the business users are using the new system and they go oh yeah oh it does that that problem that we had oh but oh but that good stuff that we had is not here i said the reason why the good stuff's not there because you threw the baby out of the bath water you didn't ask them what was working that you'd like to keep you just asked them for the problems see 
you, you guys are, and it's, it's going to take too long. I said, this is what's going to happen. You're going to waste 30 million pounds. You don't have 30 million pounds. Your competitors are eating up the market share and you're trying to catch up. And so, oh, oh, and I said, what do you recommend? And I said, we've got to start at step one, mate. And that's, sorry, you know, you, you and yeah. so, what they decided then was to break down the RFP process into a few phases. So I said, look, don't stop your RFP because you kicked it off, but don't make a decision. You know, you, you got a general features idea about what they want. Okay, continue along those, but don't make a decision. Let us catch up, current operating model assessment, et cetera. And I said, okay, I see, but if you, you, what you're doing, to your point there, is that you, one, you've not built any no partnership with the business because you've just gone on from Hurry Technologies leading this and not listening to us. So I was like, okay. Yeah, no, no, but I'm, I'm, we're on the same page here. That's great. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you just weren't, you weren't like, all these tips are terrible. Cancel the podcast. I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> I hope the listeners are getting a good, a, a lot of tips out of this one. Yeah, I have um, one more on communication. Yeah, yeah. And then um, two more that are kind of just activities. So yeah. one more on communication. Um, and I don't know why this works. And if anyone in your audience is a PhD and does know like the theory behind why this works, um, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear it. Um, I call this a, the Jedi mind trick when all else oh, fails. The um, mind and trick. yeah, it works like probably 70% of the time on decisions that are not like super, super, super emotional, right? It can't okay. be, um, you you have to fire your whole staff. It can't be that decision, um, or that news. But uh -huh. sometimes when I know, um, that I'm going to have to give someone in a leadership position or someone with authority, um, news that we are going to move forward because maybe another leader decided on the path, right? Um, with something that they, I don't think they are going to look favorably on. Mm -hmm. um, I do this thing where I tell them how they feel. Um, and it works an alarming percentage of the time. So what that might look like is, hey, Heath, um, I have some news I think you're going to agree is really great for us. Right. I just told you that yeah. we have good news we're sharing. Yeah. Um, we're going to move forward with the plan to deliver in June. Um, and it's going to deliver these benefits. I'm so glad I got to share this with you. Please let me know if you have any questions. Right. Uh -huh. No way. Yeah. He didn't want to move forward with the plan in June. Yeah. Like 70% of the time it is shocking. I will get an email back or a response back that says, oh, great. I'm so glad we're moving forward with that. It's almost like they don't remember yeah. because I've told them that that was a good thing for them, that they maybe weren't in favor of it. Yeah. Now, it doesn't work for everything. I can't be like, good news, Heath. You have to fire your whole department and everyone's redundant and I don't know what you do now. It doesn't work for that. Yeah. Um, but for smaller scale decisions, like maybe one component of a process or a, a technology they were fond of that someone else isn't, um, a feature, right? Um, it works like 70% of the time for some odd reason um, okay. for those types of decision communication. So it's like persuasive, um, um, and there's not negotiation because there's no negotiation there, um, persuasive language or I mean, assumed language. So the, you're saying that first you're giving them some good news and that um, and the relationship to their emotions is you're going to like it. Um, so yeah. they've already, now they've already, okay, I'm, I must like it. So either they're going to be two things. Yeah. It's like be cautious and saying, mm, let me see now. Or they go, okay. Or they drop their barrier, their re yeah. uh, resistance, natural resistance to adversity to change. And then, then you're going to say what the plan is. And say, so we're going ahead of X, Y, Z by so-and-so date. And then let me know. So assumed, effectively, if you was a salesman, you would have assumed the sale. And so yeah. let me know if you have any questions. Or not, not you, you specifically didn't say, let me know if you would like any changes. It says, let me know yeah. if you have any questions. And so it's like, okay, okay, so we told them good news, told them that you're going to like it, told them what the plan was, and asked them if they had any questions. Ta-da! Yeah, okay. I, Heath, I wish I knew why that works, but I have shared that with so many people and they'll look at me like, you're crazy to say, do it, just do it. And they do it. And they're like, that worked. And I'm like, I know, I don't know why it works. That wasn't a tip someone gave me. I just discovered that one day. <laughs> the Jedi um, mind trick. Okay, great. Yeah, call it the I, Jedi mind trick. I ain't going to be um, using that on something probably today. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I hope it works for you. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> yep. Um, the last two are activities. They're not communication. Um, uh -huh. So if you're not naturally empathetic, if you don't, um, I'm a little, um, it may not come across here, but I'm a little socially awkward. Um, and so no. essentially, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, so I have my, uh, uh, my uh, Marvel and Dr. I, Strange kind of mine. Um, fine, they have to but, believe. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, I've, I've a lot of growth, right, over the years, yeah, so we yeah. a decade. Um, yes. But essentially, I recommend people do two things. One, if you're coming in new to a department that you don't have an existing relationship with or a client, right, that you don't have an existing relationship with the staff you're going to be interacting with, right, maybe not mm -hmm. the leaders, but the staff, um, I recommend that people spend as much time not just shadowing the processes that they're going to be redesigning, but watching the interactions of the people, I think you talked about this in the beginning, there's norms and subcultures, right, yep, yep. that exist inside companies. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, um, watching how the staff talk to each other, the words they use, the cadence that they speak, how they schedule meetings, all that different kind of normative culture um, not only tells you what to expect with their leaders, because people mirror their leaders. Um, uh -huh. When I have when I do leadership topics, I always remind leaders that if you're seeing something in your staff that you don't like, probably pick up a mirror. You're probably doing it um, yep. because okay. people it's mirror. Beauty. That's leaders. another good one. People mirror the leaders. They do. Um, I think this is actually a theory. It's called mirror theory. Um, people in, in corporations mirror their leaders. They act like their leaders give them permission to buy their own actions. Uh -huh. um, and so kind of sitting with these people outside of analyzing what, what the processes are and trying to data mine just to see how they interact as a culture, almost like an anthropologist, um, helps you to then kind of assimilate into that same cadence of speaking, using words that resonate with them, um, okay. scheduling how they're used to. So it makes you seem less abrasive. It makes you more part of their normal stream of work. Uh -huh, and yeah. that can go a really long way in building that kind of relationship and partnership and also understanding what they care about, right? That's, that's part of empathy is understanding mm. what's in it for them, right? Um, what they care about on a day-to-day -day basis, what they get passionate about um, and why. Okay, what is an important theme? So, the, the so that there was the activity of um, if you were new to the department, uh, new no existing, no existing relationships with their staff, is to basically assimilate and assimilate. And you said observe, not just observe the process. Which would if you if you were to give a a new consultant this uh, uh, this activity to go and do, they would watch the process, but they wouldn't watch the interaction. Uh, yeah. So, so what are you actually observing? So the, that interaction, you talk about the, how they talk to each other, schedule meetings, et cetera. So, um, and why you're doing that is to basically become one of them, to yep. ass assimilate like them, um, be one of them, reduce that resistance. This is like um, when I go into programs that we will get, try and second someone from the business to be on the, our core team. Um, and partly that is, as opposed to consultants coming in and doing the transformation for them, but bringing the, the um, really senior stakeholders who become champions, change champions onto the project, who effectively are the business. Now, when the business, this person, that, that our, our, our new named change uh, champion, speaks to their own own people, it's one of, it's like the business here is one of us. They are now, yep. it's us talking to us. So yep. their, their, um, their barrier of resistance is lower. So this is what you're saying here is um, if, if you're new to a program project and you don't have that um, relationship, this is what you should do. Yep. And the best way to do that is actually ask to go to their team meetings. So not their process meetings. I always say, hey, do you have like a, a monthly, a weekly core meeting for your team? They usually say yes, right? And I said, I don't want to be on the agenda. I just want to go. I just want to see how they talk to each other. Um, okay, the great one, go to the team meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. The next activity, um, I call sit in the seat. Um, and this is after, um, this would be like, maybe someone comes to me who's working, right. Some kind of process. And they start telling me about behaviors people are doing. That's derailing things. Uh -huh. Um, such and such person isn't showing up to meetings. They're not responding to my emails. Every time we're in a meeting, they're being argumentative or they're not giving me what I need to get to what I'm, I'm getting to, right? These are things yep. we deal with. Yep. Um, but those are symptoms. Those are symptoms of yes. a root cause. Mm -hmm. And yep. so what I always try to remind people is, okay, you've brought me a ton of symptoms. Those symptoms are 
of some root cause that's probably yep. rooted in emotion somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Emotions are facts about people. Yep. And what I want you to do is sit in her seat. Um, so give me all the, po give me decision tree, right? Give me all the possible reasons that she is displaying those behaviors and doesn't like, or is adherent or uh, adverse, right? To yep. what you're trying to do. Um, and then now that we've identified all the possible root causes, because you're not just going to be able to go ask, why are you not coming to meetings? Yeah. No one's going to tell yeah. you. Yeah. Um, then you need to come up with mitigation tactics for how you would resolve every single one of those problems and go implement them until one works. Um, because the symptoms, right, are part of a problem. What do we do? We got to go solve a problem. Yes. Um, got to make and sure so you I solve the that, right problem. Yep. And I call that sit in the seat because it requires so you from from taking the perspective of someone who's having those actions occur to you to being the person in the seat and all the reasons you might do those things that person is doing. And again, that goes back to understanding what do they care about? How does this change impact them? Um, are you, you know, assimilating to their cultural norms? Like what are you doing, right? That could be causing some of these actions and doing that kind of introspection. Okay. All right. So let's, let's um, sit in the seat is the approach is the activity. And, yep. and that, is a, that is another form of empathy to understand what they are doing in their role. Um, you get the, whoever's uh, uh, presenting um, the, the, the issues that are happening is that you're calling it out what it is, which I do. There's something similar about what you, those exactly, you know, we have to be careful of like technology, uh, uh, probably the most, let's say, maybe not the biggest victim of it, but maybe a bit more pro um, caught up by it is the urgency or the need to solve what the problem that they see but the problem they see isn't the root cause it's the symptom of another one um yep. yeah so that is yeah, so the so you get this you know the, the, the task will be to identify the root causes come up with the mitigation actions and implement them until one or many or all of them were successful or you know started re um, re reducing those issues um and say so you're on the right track um yeah, and then, so yeah, so the, 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 what we what you've done there is another tool in empathy. Yep, and again, right, going back to you would do that if you saw something inefficient in a process, right? You would yep. drill all the way back through. This is just again that cognition that someone's emotions are facts about people. It is yes. part of the process. You have to do that yes. same type of work. Um, and okay. the very last one I have isn't a tip. Um, it's just a saying that I like to say um, to my team. And it's that you can be right and be a delight. Those things are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> yeah. Just because you're right doesn't mean that you have to act a certain way. You can be right and perfectly pleasant about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is, uh, yeah, that is so much about people and the way that you behave with them and interact with them, right? Yeah, so you yeah. can be right and, and a delight. So there's no, yeah. you know, like, uh, I think, you know, I'll pick on technology again, and there's no one in the tech in the room here to, to um, it's not nice when people can't defend themselves, so I won't be nasty. But they would go and say with their technology hammer, go and bang people over the head because it's a, uh, everything is a technology problem now. And it's like, well, no, it's not. But what you're doing is, you know, you are almost, you are beating people over the head with your technology stick. It's like, well, See how when you step back and you might, technology might be an answer, but don't beat people over the head with it. Yeah, that's okay. exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So then that's the empathy part again, right? Yep. That okay. is all my tips and tricks about empathy. Um, okay. and I actually would be really interested if any of your users or your users, um, I do technology, if <laughs> any of your listeners yep. Yep. um implement any of these i'd love to hear um did they have success with that did they not again not a scientific study i'm not a phd this has yep. just been my experience going from you're the reason that my children don't feel yeah. that they have a mother <laughs> to you know um yeah. really successful large-scale transformations right taking yeah. things new products to market um so kind of you know the dichotomy between those two things to me is um you know a little bit um seasoned expertise but also right a lot of implementing these types of emotional management um and empathy tools yep. to okay yeah so them. so for the listeners there if you are implementing one or all or some of these tips then yeah give us some feedback put the comments in this in the in the comment section then we'll feed them back out to laura okay so 
that's empathy. Now, the industry, what is yep. the industry doing um, that is, you know, it's, it's trailblazing? It's doing a great job, yet keep doing it. Or I like, can lessons learn, right? And what are you doing? It's not working. We'll stop doing. What are you not doing? Start doing. Yep. Um, okay. So I think something that the industry, um, and, and in both of these cases, I'm actually going to talk to the, the decision makers, likely the C-suite. Yep. Um, so um, for those of you, if you're listening and you happen to be in the C-suite of my corporation, um, don't take it out on me. This is just helpful <laughs> feedback. Um, so, um, not necessarily a, uh, you know, an implication of you. Um, not, so, not talking to you, John and Mary and that's correct. <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking specifically to you. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. just in general, yeah. what I'm seeing. Yep. So, um, something I think that, um, C-suite leaders and the industry is doing well in general is a recognition, um, that the nature of innovation is risk. Um, and that innovation is necessary. So yep. um, people are very comfortable, like you said, um, in homeostasis, change is uncomfortable. And so this kind of um, recognition, I think, by the industry and the C-suite that if we're standing still, we're really falling behind yep. um, is great. And I think we've seen a ton of progress, especially in the tech sector, um, because of that, right? New products going to market, people really getting innovative, our lives um, you know, even in the last five years have changed drastically with the things we saw come out of COVID, right? Not even just in the health tech space, but in, you know, the combined tech space. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen people really embrace um, a lot of that innovation and kind of recognize that, you know, you have to put some chips on the table to propel forward. And now that kind of everybody who's, um, is, has a cognition of that, we're seeing rapid acceleration. And I think yep. that's really good. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, with that, innovation become, becomes change and change and yeah. to the degree of change and minor to you know, large scale and transformation then yeah. comes impacts through organization and then people in it and then yeah. that would become okay innovation is great and we need it it's necessary and we're in an environment where technology is changing rapidly yeah businesses are changing but if you don't get the people in the organization to change with the, the or the speed of the innovation, one is going to get left behind. The innovation may or may not get to the full value, realize the full value that it intended in the beginning. Yep. So it brings us back to the full circle again. It does. It does. And also as a plug for why people should hire Heath, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? More transformation, yeah, yeah, more work. You. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then the thing I think that is getting missed in this process um, is something that um, I'm really passionate about. And it's that authority and expertise are not the same thing and they should not be the same thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have experienced this out in the field or not, or, or if this resonates or will resonate with your audience. Um, but I, in recent years, I feel like what I'm seeing is every project, because it's innovative um, in the most cases, and people are trying to do um, rapid, large scale change, mm -hmm. it involves a lot of divisions and departments and coordination. Yep. And what I see happen, instead of having a traditional sponsor or lead or decision maker, I'm seeing a council of decision makers, uh -huh. sometimes, you know, five to 10 people. And I don't know about you, Heath, but have you ever seen five to 10 <laughs> people, right? All agree exactly to the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I think it comes from a really great place, right? Assuming positive intent, it yes. comes from this recognition that you have to be able to understand and sit in the seat, so to speak, right? Of all these different domains and expertise. They want to yes. consider all the facts and data yes. and they want to make sure they have that um, organizational alignment top down so that the integration itself is easier. Mm -hmm. But expertise should not equal authority. Great. Have them all involved, have them all bought in and engaged you have to have a central uh, authoritative leader. Yeah, One yeah. person yes. needs to be able to say, I have examined all the data and expertise. This authority for decision is mine. And it's mm. the path we move forward. And if not one, three, because sometimes I see people do two and that doesn't work either. Yeah, um, yeah. So if not one, three, but not five to 10 experts should not, expertise is not authority. It's just yep. not. <laughs> okay, that's a great tip there. I hope <laughs> that that should not have fallen on deaf ears wherever you are in the world, wherever, whatever continent, including Antarctica. The, that yeah. is a, 
in, in, in my approach, we have a three-tiered um, uh, governance framework. You take it from the project to the, a, a authority group, a, sol a solution design authority group made up of business and technology, and that will go to Steerco. And the Steerco is chaired by one person. There's many people in this Steerco, and that yeah, that is, yeah that that authority is by one person. And I like that. If it's not one, three, because two, there's a, it's a, it's a, what would you call two it? Two doesn't work. Yeah, Mexican, Mexican standoff. It's like, okay, you, either you die or I die. And so, well, we're both going to die at the same time. So, you know, yeah. or three. So, yeah, so then there will be, a, 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 you'd like to think of majority rules, but you're yeah, not five to 10. Otherwise, yeah, that is a uh, decision by committee. And I think government agencies or government yeah, agencies and bodies are a victim of this, that, a lot of decisions are decisions by committee and the reasons why they don't make any decisions because there's too many people involved in those decision-making processes. Right. And I think um, one of the things that they lose in that process is it's not to exclude everyone, anyone from the table. Everyone should be at the table. Oh, yes. Yeah. But there's a cost to how long that decision takes. Every minute that a decision, uh, I mean, that's dramatic. Every yeah. day, week, right? Yeah. A decision isn't made to move forward. Variables that led to that decision being the best one change. change. Yeah. Other people go to market. Technologies emerge. Departments change. People mm. change. Everything is changing. Yeah, and yeah. so it's almost like um, they've recognized the nature of innovation is risk. And we should make decisions that are data driven, right? They, mm -hmm. We have to consider all the variables, but they've lost that the variables change the longer we wait. They haven't prioritized time to decision. There, is a, there are so many quotes here, Lauren, it's ridiculous. The, the nature of innovation is risk. I like that one about, yes, the, 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 the variables that um, led to taking a, a recommendation to a board for a decision that yeah. time delay impacts those variables. So the longer you sit on it, those variables change, those recommendations are now out of date. And then, so the longer, then okay. that becomes a bigger risk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one, right, that if people don't believe that, I'll give you one really tangible example. Um, cost of IT development dollars. We have seen, um, right, technology changes, right? So if you need a developer that's got a specific stack, right, in mm -hmm. their repertoire, um, or there's a new emerging technology, one, that's already going to cost you money. Yep. And two, what we saw um, through throughout COVID was just an inflation through the roof of IT dollars. Yeah. Um, so that's a great example. It might have cost you a million dollars nine months ago. It might cost you three now. Yeah, um, yeah. So yep. Yeah, you sit on it. Now it's going to cost you. So your innovation, yeah. although it's going to it solves all the problems, just cost you an arm and a leg. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So wow, that was awesome. That was awesome. Okay. So let's um, let's let's true. That is the that's that what the industry is not doing well. Well, well, they're doing well is that there was okay the the tap in the hat. So yes, innovation is required. The next part is okay. Now you've got the innovation. You are now mistakenly, unfortunately, this authority for expertise. Um, and, and to assist with that is the one or three or definitely not one or three decision makers, definitely not yeah. five to 10. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good one. All righty. So, okay. So, so we recap there. I'm not sure if I can, I've been writing notes frantically. You can see me if I put my head down. I'm, I'm writing away. For, for total disclosure, everything, there is the transcripts. So, so the listeners that um, the transcripts are on the website. Um, and then the show notes, we'll put the links to, um, to Lauren, to, to your profile on LinkedIn, to the company, um, any of the, um, any, if we can find, I'm not sure you see Craig Co. do we need to, um, the men, do we want to tip a hat to him and, um, drop us a link? We can put his link there. Um, uh, and then some quotes, if we find the sources other than yourself, um, who, who someone that, who have also said, I didn't that, knowingly plagiarize anybody, yeah, but no. no. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Um, <laughs> No, there are some really good ones. So yeah, we'll quote you on, on those. That we'll put them in the in the show notes. Okay, just to summarise, then if I can if I can do half a good job, we we talked about one was the profile of a um, of a business transmitter. Empathy is a tool set, uh, and then the industry. What are they doing right and wrong? And straight off the bat, that you said, basically, if you're not born this way, forget about it. You're you're dead in the water. No, no, you that said. That is not what I said. <laughs> no, I, I, to your what you would, you know, you said earlier about, um, you know, um, you know, there's the not so the analytical becoming um, the purpose over um, people, yeah, and that um, that was what I was using as an example there of, um, you know, just taking the piss basically. 
So no, you said that as a school, that is leaders, uh, transformators are born. Um, it is you can develop a school set, but um, you know, naturally born your evidence you showed or talked about that yes you do see it in the um, children that the then the, the their um, behaviour in the in the playground um, who naturally are trying to you know they see the holistic that the end to end the full system um, they try to get organise uh, the chaos um, I, I don't know if I was one of those um, I think if I asked my mum I think I might have been. Um, Okay, um, what else we talk about there? The thought patterns. So yes, they see things as terms of systems and wanted to break things down. There's a particular mindset that's production over people. The the caution there is um, people can mistake in that as uh, um, disrespective or uh, not acknowledging the, the people elements of it. But that's not the focus. It's the 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 um, production is in service of the people. Um, there are you had some great antidotes there about um, yeah the the reason why it has to be other than um, was it then uh, no other or is it not such uh, not the the biggest event the the change can't be a major event if you are um, the Jedi say? mind trick, you mean? Oh, like when you do the, the Jedi mind trick, it can't be some, oh, the, it can't be an emotional major. 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 Ah, okay. Yeah. Right. So what do we say? Um, small. Ah, oh, that's why I was going to give an analogy of when you talked about the production over people, um, and and uh, the way that you uh, you you had been might have been told off or being pulled over the coals for, and uh, and a previous project I was on, I was, I say to the guys on the course and and my my staff is. That just be, you know, we have an agenda to follow, a process to follow, and it has a specific, a specific reason, a, a specific purpose that we're not doing, we're not creating a cottage industry of activity. It's only for a specific outcome. And each is like an architecture and building blocks, they build on each other. Now, what you may find is the client may have a need to go chase in a mirage on the horizon. Now, what will happen is if that's not in our roadmap of activity, what will happen after this so-called fire that you've been told to go put out has um, now been put out? The attention is going to come back to you about, oh, you told us this plan and then you had these milestones, but you haven't done them. And the reason why you haven't done them is because you were told to go put out these fires. These fires that were really meaningless were a distraction. And you talked about before about uh, um, when people will intentionally try to make a project fail. So that there will be an example of you being distracted, being pulled off um, to another direction. Yeah, just be mindful of that. Have your plan. Stick to the plan. Okay. So yeah, you have some other antidotes. One of them included the M and A integration um, with people. The emotional management mindset was in there, um, and it's uh, you talked about um, about your experience with the role and promotion. And they said, well, there was about um, people may panic. Uh, and that was the uh, the uh, uh, lightning for you. It's like, okay, there's something I need to pay attention to. And then you got a hold of your your mentor, Craig Co. Craig Co. to get it right? No, not Greg. Yep. Craig. Okay. Yep. And he gave some great tips. I think this is a great quote here about your emotions are facts about people. That uh, it's, that's the evidence base. And I think if you're like you're analytical, will come from the, you, you call them the STEM careers that you might. Um, is because you're not trained in, in that way. You're trained technically in hard and solid, solid or structured um, tools and techniques um, that you may miss the, the softer skills um, and yeah. totally disregard them. But um, no, you should pay attention to them. Um, what to say? This is the, the scientific, um, if you wanted to have scientific and evidence based. And that was what you did yourself, right? You, you tested it. Uh, and, and you saw the results um, as, and, and, and I think that was the call that you set out to the, the audiences. If you want to see for yourself, do a test. No, yep. Yeah, what do you have to lose? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, nothing. Um, okay. And I uh, think you, you talked about going good to great. And I thought of that, um, um, is it not Jim Rohn? Um, there's a book, Good to Great, um, or Great to Good. Um, it, it, um, it's, it's Jim Collins. Jim Collins, Good to Great. And he's got a couple quite similar. So he's taking the business from you know here to here, transformation. Um, you talked about the difference of compassion versus empathy, which I think to the uninitiated could be easily confused as one and the same. 
compassion yeah. being uh, feelings as opposed to emotion is the ability, empathy, the ability to step into someone else's shoes to understand how they feel for a particular purpose and that purpose is to change behavior. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we talked about oh, the communication. Fluff the emails. Now, and there's a structure to the fluffing the emails. Um, yeah. You are keeping it, oh, first of all, there's a greeting, you're friendly, um, and then there's a, there's, a, there's an offer for help, um, and always that offer for help so that they feel that they are not on their own, that there is support, and particularly that um, they will come back to you, and, and when they do need you, they will ask, or they do need support, they will actually ask mm -hmm. for it, because um, then what you'll have is they will avoid you, which you yeah. don't want to do. Um, and the other part was the business after people so the the people element first in your um in your communications um so that was an effect of that is to humanize their interaction the communication yeah make the work small that's the words make the work small okay and then the other part of um us business transmitters do a lot of thinking um so and so going into the meetings we go into these meetings because we've thought ahead of time that we have a particular stance on the outcome of those meetings. But like technology, you shouldn't run around with your technology stick and bang people over the head. There's to go right. in there to listen. And you go in there by asking questions. Um, yeah, so you might want to remind them uh, if you know, yeah, if you know the most, your quote, say the least. Yep. I think there's something, uh, I'm not sure who sits like there. you got a mouth, one mouth, two, two ears, that you use them in that proportion. Yep. Okay. And then ask questions as opposed to provide solutions, which for some coming from a technical, there's, there's STEM careers, um, may be almost a paradigm shift because, and, and, and those also new to consulting is like, well, we now ask for answers, we want to give them. And I, 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 I talked about it in my book and talked about, you know, a good consultant isn't one that has all the answers, they have all the questions. And so you, our, our, well, I believe in going to the mo and business led transformation is the people closest to the pain or the people close to the process are those that know how best to change it. What they yeah. don't know is how to change it. So the skill is in the business transformator to get those answers out of them. And so that is the questions that you ask. And, and and so those the the the, the more skill and I think you, you alluded to it and from a junior to a, you know more experienced is that you ask the right question you can ask the least questions to get the the most the correct or the most leverage out of the answers you get as if you've only got five minutes some cases and if you're lucky a bit longer so your questions that you ask have to be on the money That's right. okay and then you talked about the the calmed, measured pauses, which can be uncomfortable silences, but necessary silences that allow that speaking, that, that thinking space for your audience, that they can um, allow them to catch up because you have you are a thinking person and you've done this before or more familiar with it. You know the process that from the, and like the guys in BAU and business who you're helping change, they might not have the space to step back. To, to think about it. So have those pauses and what that means in practice is allow 10 seconds. So, and don't be afraid of those 10 seconds and delayed no, thinking about, um, you would reply to say, you're thinking, you know, instead of automatically replying no, is that you reply and say, I'm thinking about it, whether you might've already consciously, or unconsciously already made that decision. Um, so, and that helps from the people's perspective, the empathy is that you have validated their think their thinking and feelings that um you are and but you can delay it then there was a, the caveat with the delay of delay it to the point of where it's not detrimental to the project yeah yep okay proportional to its priority <laughs> proportional to priority exactly so i talk about um um context and and you know like i get guys call me Heath I'm trying to apply your book to the framework to, to the your framework to the letter and I said whoa 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 you know it's proportion proportion to your situation to your client this is not made or written to be applied through the letter to the book for anyone it is your skill to apply two things proportionately and appropriately so um yeah so that's that is there it's proportional to the context um 
and another part that helps is it helps build the partnership. You had the number seven was the jetty minds the jet eye mindset the jetty the jet eye mindset that um, I, I like this approach. This is where you are you are telling them we've got some good news and they're gonna like it. I love that. It's like I'm gonna go to the re uh, to a restaurant tonight and say you know, I'm gonna play the jet eye mindset on the waiter. <laughs> You're gonna tell the chef he's gonna change it and he's gonna like it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And uh, and you're telling them what you're doing. You're going ahead of the plan. And let me know if you've got any questions as opposed to any changes. So very specific about, now you've liked it. I've got some good news. So you're happy and you're going to like it. So you agree. And this is the plan. So now you know. And then yep. if you've got any questions, you can say, but you most likely won't. Okay. Yep. So, and then, so some, a couple of activities is if you are new to a project program and you don't have that personal um, operational level relationships is to build that um, um so how you build that is assimilate with with the the, the business um you are observing the process and as i said that's not just observing the end-to-end -end process but the interaction as you said um, of how they interact with each other as well as including how they schedule calls uh, uh meetings um and then what did we have there? We had um, any go-to team meetings. And then you had to sit in the seat. Um, and sit in the seat was to understand, um, and the sit in the seat is where you see some behavior that is detrimental to the project, which is in most cases a symptom of some other cause, that cause being the root cause, while well, you want to get down to the root cause. Um, so the activity there is, is to come up with some mitigation actions and implement them and see which one is working. And then, you know, like any MVP or pilot, double down and finish it off. Okay. okay. All right. And then what do we have there? If you are right, you can be right and be a delight. Some more quotes right. there. Okay. So you don't have to be like technology. Yeah, I told you so. Um, and then, so what the industry is doing well is they are great with innovation. What, so they know it's necessary um, and innovation comes at a cost. There is, well, there is risks involved. Um, one being that if you get it, one, you get it wrong um, and you, you go off in the wrong direction. One other thing is if you've got a um, some project that you need, transformation you need to implement and it's slow, then of course you're going to miss it. Um, yep. The other one, the, the, the thing that the industry is not doing, the two parts, authority is, and expertise are not the same thing. Um, yeah, so that, I think that is... And then an example of the previous client there is we've got a lean expert, we've got a safe expert, and so yes, and 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 so and the, the best follow up to that was, well, actually talking to the experts there was, well, it's used over there and it's used in lot, of, and so so yeah, great. How is it going to be used here? I'm less interested in how it's used there. I'm more interested yep. in how it's used here. So that's instead of just taking the the so-called expertise, it's like yeah, okay, now you've got the you know you, you are able to tell me about how it's used, but how are we going to use it here? I'll do, we, and I said they'll note a mode of print, um, uh, or a mode of uh, operandi, uh, modus operandi. I, I we adopted back at, back there was we will now question the question. So, so question the question straight off the bat. No more adopting whatever was said. Okay, and the last one. If I've got this right, was assuming everyone has good intentions and the decision-making authority is that you only want to have one or three, but not five or ten. That's right. Can't ever get to a decision. You did a great job, Heath. Oh, <laughs> great. I think do I sum it up all right? Yeah, it's perfect. Oh, fantastic. Okay, okay, Lauren, thank you very much. What I'll do now, this will this will go live hopefully very very soon. Um, what do, I won't say the date, but we'll say soon. You know, that's a that's a classic um, project management. Okay, yeah. soon. When do you want yeah. to? Yep. So that'll go soon. I'll let you know when it's live. All the show notes will be there. Links to get in touch with you um, and, and all your background. Um, yeah, we'll all be there and, and the quotes and everything else. All right. Thanks so much, Heath. I appreciate it. Oh, Thanks for having my me. pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on. Okay. Catch you later. Bye. Okay. Bye.